All right, guys, so today we're going to be going over urinary stress incontinence. So as I said before, this is one of the four main types of incontinences that you're going to encounter when it comes to involuntary voiding of urine. So the big way to remember this is stress equals squish. There is an increase in intra-abdominal pressure, which is causing the involuntary loss of urine. So let's get into it. So anatomy that's associated with this condition, the bladder is the big one. Big things to notice is the different urethra sphinx, the different urethral sphincters. So we have the external urethral sphincter and the internal urethral sphincter. So the internal one, that is the one that is involuntary smooth muscle. So same kind of smooth muscle going on as the rest of the bladder. The bladder has the detrusor muscle. So that's the smooth muscle, smooth muscle, muscle. <laughs> and so the internal urethral sphincter is smooth muscle. So therefore it is involuntary. So your body cannot control when it opens or closes. It just does what it wants to do. So the external urethral sphincter, on the other hand, is voluntary skeletal muscle. So that's why I had that as the question of the day, just to kind of, you know, have you guys think about it. So voluntary skeletal muscle. And this is why most of us, if we feel like we're feeling the urge to urinate, we're not urinating on ourselves because we have control of that external urethral sphincter. And therefore we're not avoiding urine until we're sitting on a toilet, hopefully. Um, the urethra, and it's kind of the big one, just understanding that that's where urine's going through, understanding the sphincters of the urethra. And then the pelvic floor musculature is associated with the external urethral sphincter. So that is this, um, if you can see this interogenital diaphragm, that is part of your pelvic floor musculature. So understanding that that is under voluntary control, which means if we have urinary stress incontinence, if it's under voluntary control, we can control it. So here is just some etiology of how this condition happens. So with urinary stress incontinence, this is the involuntary loss of urine due to an increase in intra-abdominal pressure. So that's why I think stress as squish. So you're, you know, like the intra-abdominal pressure, you're squishing your like guts in, then that causes an increase in your chance of involuntarily voiding urine. So common causes of this would be pregnancy and vaginal delivery. I'd say this is probably the most common one that you're going to see within this population because after a pregnant person has their baby, um, their pelvic floor musculature tends to get stretched and weak. And usually that's a big thing that happens with this specifically a vaginal delivery. So with genital urinary surgery, so this is also things that can happen during pregnancy or delivery. So this is stuff such as an episiotomy for males, it would be prostate gland surgery slash removal. So understanding that this could be something that's happening when it comes to a uh, post-surgical complication. Neurological conditions such as multiple sclerosis, uh, any sort of spinal cord injuries. So this is when those individuals are going to have to use intermittent catheterization in order to avoid urine to avoid this situation where they might accidentally void urine on themselves if they like cough or sneeze or something like that. And then um, this is due to a lack of bladder control and a lack of control of the uh, sacral segments of the spinal cord due to either an injury or with multiple sclerosis, it does affect the central nervous system. So that is why they might have a spastic bladder. Obesity, that's due to the pressure that is being placed on the pelvic floor itself by the weight of the body with the excess fat. Um, and so that increased stress would be the reason why that incontinence could happen. Um, urinary tract infections, so especially ones that are recurrent. So the more often that you have these, the more often, the more likely you're going to have some sort of issue with your pelvic floor in general, due to the fact that like it's painful to urinate and things like that, and like just the increase in intra-abdominal pressure. Um, any sort of bladder, uterine, or rectal prolapse. So if things are falling out of you, that means your pelvic floor is not working well. So therefore, you're probably going to have an involuntary loss of urine if your bladder is also falling out. So um, this is where we don't want to get with these patients. We want to work on this before something really scary like that happens. Um, aging in general, so like the just weakness of the muscles themselves, because remember, it is a skeletal muscle. And you're going to like lose some tone as you get older and your muscles are not going to work the way that they used to. So this could be one of those things, but it shouldn't be one of those things where our patients are like, well, I guess this is how it is when I get older. No, we can do things about it. It's okay. And then any sort of sphincter incompetence. So like understanding that the sphincter is just not working well, especially that external one that's under voluntary control. If either one of them's like struggling, we could have an issue regardless. So 
what is this going to look like with a patient? So we're going to see pelvic floor weakness, especially in the elevator anti muscle groups. So those are the ones that are responsible for Kegels and stuff like that. Um, understanding that it could be neurological. So the pedundal nerve could be damaged. And that's the one that's kind of innervating a lot of those sacral segments and everything. So not just the bladder, but also all the voluntary skeletal muscle down on the pelvic floor. And then any sort of involuntary loss of urine to an, due to an increase in intra-abdominal pressure. So activities that could cause this increase in intra-abdominal pressure would be like coughing, sneezing, jumping, any sort of valsalva maneuver while you're straining something or lifting in general. I'm sure you've heard of um, women postpartum or any individual who's had a baby postpartum who like has been like squatting or something like that. And they're like, oh, I think I just peed myself. Or maybe they were like jumping rope and they're like, oh, I think I just peed myself. That's kind of what's going on with this situation. Just anything that's increasing an intra-abdominal pressure, that's what's causing it. Um, so I like to say, as I said before, urinary stress equals squish because of that like squishing of the intra-abdominal area. So squishing it because you're either coughing, sneezing, valsalving, that is what is causing the involuntary loss of urine. So other symptoms that we could see besides any sort of involuntary urine loss would be urinary frequency. So if you always feel like you're about to pee yourself, you might feel like you have to go all the time and then it's like a dribble kind of coming out. So you'll see like a weak stream or just dribbling while urinating. And then nocturia, that is where you're going to be urinating frequently at night. So these are important terms to kind of know as well for like other conditions because um, it'll show up like that. So then this is kind of one of those things that can happen. So how are we treating it with our pelvic floor physical therapists? We love them. They're awesome. And you can do pelvic floor PT as a PTA. I have uh, people that I went to school with and that's what they do now. Um, I work with some pelvic floor PTs. I don't do it myself. It's a little scary for me. I prefer my feet, but um, it's really, really a great resource for many individuals who are suffering from any sort of pelvic floor things. And this is not just like postpartum, like women, this is literally anybody under the sun who would need their pelvic floor either strengthened or relaxed because you can't have a hypertonic pelvic floor. But off my soapbox, I promote pelvic floor PT to everybody. Um, biofeedback would be good for this individual specifically with this urinary stress incontinence to facilitate muscle activation. So in this case, because the pelvic floor muscles are not working the way that they're supposed to, and they're kind of weak, we're going to facilitate that muscle activation and then using biofeedback. So remember, biofeedback is not electrical stimulation. What biofeedback is picking up is how much muscles are activating and stuff like that. So maybe with this individual, we want to see that that little bar that's on like the little console, like thing that they're holding to like see the visualize it, they want the bar to go up. So then we can work on contracting the pelvic floor musculature. So again, we can also facilitate use of pelvic floor musculature through tapping techniques, similar to how we would do this with like NDT tapping to facilitate like hip flexor movement or quad activation with a patient trying to ambulate, same kind of thing with pelvic floor musculature. I'm not sure how to do it, but that's a thing they do. Strengthening the lower extremity muscles and also working on the lower abdominal muscles as well. So we wanna work on some adductor strengthening with this patient just to help facilitate as we squeeze the adductors, thinking of it squeezing all the way up into their pelvic floor. This is a good exercise I give to patients. I'll give them the, the usually it's a yellow ball to squeeze. I feel like everyone has a yellow ball. You know what I'm talking about. And you'll squeeze the ball and to think of not just the adductor squeezing, but squeezing all the way up into the pelvic floor into like the transverse abdominis, like really squeezing everything up in there that is a great one to help with strengthening the pelvic floor. Kegel exercises. So they're kind of weird to teach patients and the biofeedback will help them figure out if they're doing it right or wrong. But essentially it's just, you're squeezing, pulling everything up and in. That's kind of how it feels. That's the best way I've described it to people. And that's the best way that they feel like it works. Another thing is vaginal cones. So this is just to help facilitate that Kegel kind of motion of like pulling everything up and in to help contract the pelvic floor musculature. And usually these are given as a home exercise program. So a lot of this is just teaching patients like, hey, we need to work on our Kegels. We need to work on our exercises. We need to make sure that we're, you know, completing these, taking care of ourselves and not being so hard on ourselves when it comes to pelvic floor stuff, because this can be embarrassing for some patients. So just kind of understand 
understand that um, this is something that they might be a little like weary talking about, but understanding it's, it's a normal thing that can happen to some people as a complication of either pregnancy or surgery or some neurological condition, just kind of helping them feel a lot less stressed about it. And that's more like a clinical thing rather than board studying. Um, another thing we can do for these patients is just, you know, the habituation, that bladder retraining, kind of telling them, okay, we're going to go to the bathroom at certain times for that timed voiding kind of thing, helping retrain like how it feels to fully empty the bladder. A lot of the stuff, the pelvic floor PTs can do so many cool things. Like it's pretty freaking neat how they figured all this stuff out. Um, Self-care. And then a big one is the squatty potty because that puts the pelvic floor musculature in such a good position that allows it to, it helps with every, like pretty much all of the pelvic floor um, conditions that could happen. Just making sure you put the pelvis in an appropriate position to help lengthen the musculature. So then they're not straining and then they end up going the other way. So that's also great for these patients. So remember with stress incontinence, we're going to strengthen. That's another thing. So the S in stress, that means we're going to strengthen. If we have a hypertonic pelvic floor or something like that, that's where we need to relax things. But this is a stress one. So we need to strengthen. So that's how I like to think about it. Keywords we want to think about for urinary stress incontinence is the increase in intra-abdominal pressure causing that involuntary loss of urine during activity or in general. So any sort of increase in that's like that squishing motion that is going to cause um, involuntary loss of urine. So this could also happen with activity. I know there's some things that they talk about with people jumping around, sneezing, coughing, all of that stuff, Valsalva, lifting, all of those, if they're saying the patient is doing this, like they're saying they're coughing and they're voiding urine, which your incontinence is this? It's stress because we squished something and now it's coming out. That is what's going on with this. And then any sort of sphincter incompetence. So we're seeing like the sphincters just, they're not working the way that they should. That could lean a little bit more towards any ones where we're voiding urine involuntarily. So that could be uh, urinary stress incontinence. And then any sort of postpartum individual that is going to definitely lean towards urinary stress incontinence because one of the most common causes is post-pregnancy. So postpartum individual could be developing this. So sample question, guys. A physical therapist is treating a patient who is six weeks postpartum. The patient states that she constantly needs to wear a panty liner because she will frequently void urine when picking up her baby stroller to load into the car. What intervention would not be appropriate for this patient? One, biofeedback to facilitate pelvic floor muscles. Two, holding her breath when loading the stroller into the car. Three, Kegel exercises, or four, adductor ball squeeze. So I'll give you guys a second to think about this. All right, guys, so the answer is holding her breath while loading a stroller into the car. So we're looking at this. It doesn't say that this patient is having urinary stress incontinence, but we can kind of figure out what's going on wrong. So she's six weeks postpartum. We see that. Okay. We're putting that in the back of our arsenal. She's constantly needs to wear a panty liner because she will frequently void urine when picking up her baby stroller into the car. That is essentially the definition of urinary stress incontinence. Cause here's the stress that's squishing her. She's picking something up lifting. That was one of our keywords and we'll void urine as she lifts it up. Okay. So from this, we're saying, okay, this person probably has urinary stress incontinence. So it didn't say it exactly, but we can use our context clues, pick out our keywords and kind of sell, like diagnose this patient of what's going on. So based on that, we're looking through this, we're like, okay, she's voiding urine. She has to wear a panty liner because she accidentally does it a lot. She's six weeks postpartum. Okay. Well, we got all the things. So we're looking what's not appropriate for this patient. So remember that not word will show up. I love using not. I like using not because then you can see three answers that are appropriate. So that's why I like using not. But we can see like number one, biofeedback to facilitate pelvic floor muscles. That's something we'd want to do. So that would be appropriate. So we can get rid of that. Holding her breath while loading her stroller into the car. Well, we don't want someone who has urinary stress incontinence to perform the Valsalva maneuver. And that's literally what this is, holding her breath while lifting something up. That is Valsalva, essentially. The, like, or at least just increasing intra-abdominal pressure at the very least. So that's probably something we don't want to do. And we probably don't want to tell most of our patients to hold their breath while they pick something up. Um, 
Kegel exercises. So because we're saying this is urinary stress incontinence from what we've deduced, that's something that's definitely appropriate for this patient. So doesn't fall under the what's not appropriate. So that one's wrong. And then I talked so lovely about the adductor ball squeeze. So that should have been one that you could have gotten rid of right away. But yes, that would be appropriate for this patient to strengthen as well as to facilitate um, activation of the pelvic floor musculature. So what's not appropriate for this patient? Holding her breath while loading the stroller into the car. So I hope that that was helpful for everybody and that you guys learned something about urinary stress incontinence and kind of how to jam that into your mind of what's going on. Um, Well, thank you. And I will see you in the next video. Take care.